No, it's this weekend. So uh, we're going to start Friday night, and uh, that service will be at 6 o'clock uh, Friday night. So um, would <clears throat> I would just really like to ask you over the weekend, just, just make a commitment to be here uh, for out, throughout the weekend. It's going to be a, a, a great weekend. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, David Williams, who is Lincoln County's new director of missions at our association, uh, he's going to be our speaker for the weekend. And uh, so it's going to give us time to, to get to know our new director of mission and for him to get to know us. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward. Uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. I uh, got to meet with him this past week and have lunch with him and all. And, um, and I think that, uh, that, that you're going to um, really, uh, really like him and, and, and getting to welcome him into our association. And, and have him here at our church. So, so we're going to have a full weekend. Uh, if you didn't get a uh, revival schedule, I think, is it in the bulletin, by the way? Is it in there? Yeah, there it is. So, uh, so you can, bless you. So you can see all of our uh, festivities uh, that we have going on. Uh, we're going to worship and we're going to eat all weekend. And uh, we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to have a great weekend as we seek the Lord uh, together. And so, uh, so make a commitment uh, to be here. Make a commitment to be a part of uh, the weekend. And God's going God's to gonna really do some great things uh, in our lives and in our church as we uh, prepare uh, for that for revival this weekend. So do I have any, have any questions, by the way? If you would like to help with something uh, during revival, we still have some sign-up sheets out here in the, in the foyer. Um, <clears throat> if you would like to, uh, to help with greeting... I'd love to have some folks that show up a little early and, and, and uh, stand out front and just say hey to you when you come in. Or you say hey to somebody when they come in. So, uh, you know, we always need somebody with a smile, don't we? Don't you like to see people smiling when you come to church? And, uh, and so, I uh, would love to have some greeters, men or women. I know we have a couple people signed up to do that. Um, but, uh, but maybe some of the rest of you would like to do that. Uh, come a little early and and, uh, and just welcome people and uh, let them know that, uh, hey, it's good to be here this weekend. Uh, also, uh, our prayer team, uh, we have a few people signed up for the prayer team. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, um, <clears throat> the folks on the prayer team are, are going to be praying not only, uh, obviously, for the revival in general, uh, but they'll be coming a little early and, and praying over our sanctuary and, and praying over our speakers and, and uh, those that will be attending. And we'd love to have you be a part of that, too. So you can sign up for the prayer team. If you would like to, uh, to help, I know we're going to need some um, uh, help with, uh, with cleanup, with those types of things. Um, I know uh, Brotherhood is doing the supper su uh, Saturday night. And uh, so if you'd like to help with that, uh, you can check with Tim, <coughs> with Tim Vaughn. Uh, we're doing hamburgers, hot dogs uh, Saturday night. And then Sunday night, uh, we're going to do uh, Jambalaya and Jesus. So... Uh, Miss Carrie's kind of heading up that uh, cooking team for us. So if you would like to help with that supper in some way, if, if you would uh, check with Miss Carrie, or you can sign up, and I'll make sure y'all get uh, connected there. And, um, and also, we always use folks to, to help clean up, to, to, do, to do those types of things. And uh, so there's something that, that we can all do there as we uh, participate in revival and what God wants uh, to happen this weekend in our church. All right. Um, and then you can see the upcoming events that, that we have coming uh, down the pipe. Uh, the last two Sundays of uh, August is going to be uh, in his image event. And uh, that addresses, as you can see there, uh, it addresses uh, the uh, situation or what, what does the Bible say about homosexuality and gender identity. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, watching this documentary, a two-part uh, series. And uh, then we'll be breaking into classes and have some discussion about that. And so, um, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to those events. And then the Chosen Bible Series will be in September. Uh, in His Image is, a, is an important um, cultural issue today, I guess you could say. It, it, it is uh, front and center. Uh, so many things uh, about identity and gender and so forth that's out there. And it's a very serious topic. You know, there's a lot of people uh, in our culture, a lot of people, uh, a lot of young people in our schools uh, that, that are struggling with these issues. And, uh, and we need to take those issues very seriously and, um, and address those issues 
from a biblical perspective and from a truth perspective. And that's why we're holding uh, this, um, this um, uh, event. And uh, so hopefully it'll be something that will be uh, very helpful for us as Christians uh, to have a voice, uh, a biblical voice in, in some of the issues that we have in our culture, but to have a voice that is a voice that is compassionate and loving as well in addressing those issues. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to, to those events. All right. Alan, you did a great job with announcements, by the way. I, I just want to put my plugs in a little bit. I got one more plug before, before, we get, uh, before we get started this morning in worship, and that is we had 101 in Sunday school today. How about that? So I want to say uh, thank you uh, for, for showing up and being a part of Sunday school uh, this, this morning. Uh, we want to grow our Sunday school because it's in Sunday school that, we're, that we truly study God's Word together and grow together. We're changing um, uh, our material for our youth, uh, for our children, through our uh, adults. Um, and so I want to show you a little clip from Answers in Genesis, uh, Ken Ham. And, uh, and, and that it'll be the material that we, we've already ordered it. We'll be starting it uh, in September. And, uh, and we're hoping that it's going to be something that all of us, from our children to our adults, can, uh, can really get in God's Word and get to studying and growing together because that's exactly what we need. We need to grow in Christ and we need to grow in the truth of his word. So watch this little 58 second clip for us and then we'll get started with the worship. Two thirds of young people are leaving the church by college age and biblical illiteracy is rising. People simply don't know what the Bible teaches or how to defend what they believe. What can we do to raise up a generation of young people who love God's word and know how to answer today's skeptical questions? Well, to help parents, pastors, and other Christian leaders with this vital task, we developed Answers Bible Curriculum, a Sunday school curriculum that takes you on a chronological tour of the whole Bible over four years. 200 lessons address the real life issues of Christians today, and you'll get a thorough understanding of the authority of scripture and its primary teaching. And it's synchronized from preschool to adults. So the whole family is learning the same thing at varying levels. I encourage you to order Answers Bible Curriculum for your church, Christian or homeschool. Learn more at AnswersBibleCurriculum.com. Lord, I thank you that you're willing to come to this earth and, Lord, step into a broken world, a world that was burdened with our sin, the sin of humanity. And, Lord, you were willing to pay our sin debt as you died on that old rugged cross. Lord, thank you. You didn't have to do that. But thank you for your love for us, for your grace, for your mercy. And Lord, thank you that you choose us. Lord, thank you for choosing us. Lord, you love us just the way we are. You choose us just the way we are. But Lord, through the working of your spirit, you forgive us. Lord, you cleanse us and you bring us into your family as a child of God. And Lord, you change us to bear the image of Christ. And Lord, as we look at your word today, Lord, may you speak into our hearts, Lord, and may that process of change, Lord, may, may it take one more step in each of our lives as we follow you by faith and allow you to change our hearts to bear the image of God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would take your Bible this morning and, and turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Uh, Luke chapter 5 this morning. I read this old story. Now back in the horse and buggy days, okay? 
And this gentleman named Mr. Huxley uh, had a speaking engagement. And he was rushing from, from one speaking engagement uh, to another speaking engagement. And so he headed out uh, of his hotel and he just assumed that uh, the clerk at the hotel had told the uh, horse-drawn taxi that he was going to the train station. He just assumed it. And so he rushes out of the hotel. He jumps in uh, the horse-drawn uh, carriage that was the taxi. And all he says to the driver is, drive fast, drive fast. Well, the driver gets the horses going and boom, they take off. Dust flying, man, they, they, are, they are speeding away, driving fast. Well, Mr. Huxley, as he sits there for a few minutes, he's pretty familiar with the area. He begins to look around and he realizes they're going in the opposite direction of the chain station. So he calls to the driver of the carriage. He says, do you know where you're going? And without turning around, the driver says, no, but I'm going fast. How many of us as Christians, man, we're going fast. We're busy. Our schedules are full. We're, we're can to can't a lot of times. But let me ask you this. Where are you going? Where are you going? Have you ever sat down in, in the busyness of your schedule and all of the things that you have that you got to do? And, and I could probably ask you, hey, what you got going on this week? And you're going to tell me, well, I got to do this, got to do that. I got to take the kids here. I got to take the kids there. I got this. I got that. And then somehow I got to get to revival next weekend because a preacher asked me to. Right? And we, we have all of these things that we're so busy for, that we're rushing for, that we're living our life 90 miles an hour about, but where are we really going? What's our purpose in all of it? You know, as Christians, our, our lives go by so fast. Life is short. And for that reason, as a believer, because life is short and because things go by so fast, that makes it that much more important that your life and my life is in line with the will of God. Wouldn't you say? That, that we're going in a hurry somewhere, but we're living for God's purpose. That we're living for God's purpose. You know, and that's really what revival kind of comes down to. You know, we have this experience with Jesus that, that renews our love for Him and revives our desire to follow Him faithfully. But through this experience with Jesus, we have a revived purpose. We kind of renew our purpose for, for why we're saved and how we're to be living our lives for Jesus and how He is empowering us to fulfill the purpose for which He saved us for. And that's what I want us to really think about today is as we look at these encounters at the feet of Jesus in the Gospels and, and how God's power came into people's lives as they sat at the feet of Jesus and experienced Him personally. We see how we should have repentance toward God and we receive from God. And then we are revived by God. And that takes place at the feet of Jesus. We've talked about the, the suffering woman who, who pressed through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment and experienced the power of God's healing in her life. Last Sunday, we talked about the, the sinful woman who, who showed up at the dinner party uninvited. But regardless of what others thought about her, she anointed the feet of Jesus in, in her love and devotion for him. And she experienced the power of his love and his forgiveness in her life. Wednesday night, we talked about the demon-possessed man who experienced the mercy of God and the power of Christ to deliver him from bondage, to restore him and to empower him to be a witness for God. The power of deliverance. And this morning I want us to look in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11 this morning. And I want you to think about the power of purpose. That God brings 
His purpose into your life as a believer. And today, let's watch, let's look at the scripture a little differently today. Uh, we're going to watch a, a clip from the video Bible of the Gospel of Luke. And you can follow along if your Bible, if you would, if you would like. But it's a reading of the scriptures that will be uh, played out for us. So let's watch this verse through the video Bible this morning. Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Wow, a remarkable experience, right? You know, this is the only... If this were the only New Testament passage that we had, Luke 5, 1 through 11, we would know all that we need to know about Jesus and about his call on our lives. It is that revealing and, and that telling. Uh, but let's look together here at this, this encounter, this experience uh, that they had with Jesus and, and see uh, the few things that we need to take from it, that we need to learn about it. The very first thing I want you to see is this. I want you to see the deity of Jesus. The deity of Jesus here. So when you think about it, this particular passage of Scripture shows us very clearly that Jesus is God. That Jesus is God. Now when it comes to knowing and understanding who Jesus is, the New Testament writers make it very, very clear that Jesus is God. Now when you go to John chapter 1 verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When you go on down to verse 14, it says that the Word was made flesh and made His dwelling among us as the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Bible is, is very, very clear that Jesus Himself was fully God. He was God the Son. So by nature, that means that He possesses all of the eternal qualities and all of the eternal attributes of God. Jesus would say of Himself in John 14, 9, Anyone who has seen Me has seen the Father. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So when Simon Peter ha has this experience, th this encounter, and he experiences this miracle, he is coming to the realization that he is in the presence of God. That's why he would fall at the knees of Jesus and say, you know, depart from me, I I I'm a sinful man. Because he is realizing he is in the presence of holiness. But I want you to think about with this encounter, there are five things of the attributes of God that we see in Jesus. And the first is, is this that I want you to see. Jesus is the source of truth. He is the source of truth. Look there in your Bibles in, in verse 1. 
it says that they were crowding around him. And, and what, were, what were they doing? They were listening to the word of God. They were listening to God's word. His word on forgiveness and salvation, on the kingdom of God, on eternal life. And see, when Jesus spoke, and we see this throughout the Gospels, but it's very clear here. When Jesus spoke, he did not use, he did not speak like other teachers of the law, like scribes and Pharisees and other religious leaders. He did not use references from others or quotes from others. He didn't cite the latest commentaries of his day or the popular rabbis of his day. You never see Jesus going to seminary or taking a seminar. You never even see him going to the library. When Jesus spoke, he spoke the word of God. Because he was the word. He was the source of truth. When you heard Jesus speak, you received the pure, unfiltered, living word of God. In John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said it like this. I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He and he alone is the source of truth. And every time you read your scriptures... And you hear Jesus speak, you are reading a record of what God is saying. The second thing I want you to see is this. Not only is Jesus the source of truth, but Jesus is all-knowing. He is all-knowing. And do you find anything interesting about, about this story? Here's Jesus, the, the carpenter and, and the rabbi, and he's telling the fishermen where to fish. Now... We have some fishermen in here, right? We have some pretty good fishermen in here. But the greatest challenge of even the best fishermen is to know where to find the fish. Right? You can't catch fish if you don't know where they are. And some people have become pretty good at finding fish. But when you look at this incident and this encounter, what you see here is, Jesus, compared to a professional fisherman, Jesus knows where the fish are. Listen to what the scripture says in Isaiah 40, 28. Known to God from eternity are all of his works. God knows all of his works, backwards and forwards. In Hebrews chapter 14, 13, it says, There's no creature hidden from his sight. God knows where every fish in every lake and every ocean is at all times. He knows all things about each one of us as well. There's nothing about you that God doesn't know. And we see here with Jesus that he is all knowing. He says, hey, go put out in the deep water because I know where the fish are. But not only do we see this, but we see that he's all powerful. You know, Genesis chapter 18, 14, it says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Matthew 19, 26 says, With God, all things are possible. And so we see in the life of Jesus, we see from healing the, the sick and the suffering to delivering the demonic from spirits to opening the eyes of the blind, to cleansing the lepers, to calming the storms, to feeding the multitudes, to raising the dead. We see the power of God demonstrated through the life of Jesus. And here, Peter and his business partners, the other fishermen, these professional fishermen, they experienced the power of God. And it says there, they were amazed. They caught such a large number of fish. They were amazed. They were astonished. At the catch. In other words, what Jesus did through his power blew their minds. It blew their minds. 
But not only that, but you see that not only is Jesus the source of truth and he's all-knowing and he's all-powerful, but you see that Jesus is holy. He is set apart. He's different from all of creation. And this is something that Peter, Simon Peter, saw very clearly in this moment. As he fell at the feet of Jesus and he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He is recognizing that he is standing in the presence of God. He is standing in the presence of holiness and purity. But not only that, but you see that Jesus is merciful. He is merciful. He is extending the love and the mercy of God. And in this counter, you see Jesus setting the stage, putting everything in place to bring Simon Peter and the other fishermen and others who were following to bring them into a deeper relationship with himself because he loved them. He is extending the very mercy of God to them, saying, hey, I have a purpose for your life. You're no longer going to catch fish You're going to catch people for the kingdom of God. This is my mercy. This is my grace. This is my love. I'm reviving and renewing your purpose. And so we see all these attributes and characteristics of Jesus, and they all point to one thing. Jesus is God. And when you look at Scripture, Hebrews chapter 1, Scripture is very clear on this. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, Long ago God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. So that is going through the Old Testament, saying, hey, God spoke through the Old Testament. He did it many different ways. He did it through many different prophets. But look at here. In the last days, He has spoken to us by who? His Son. Whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So the universe, all of creation was made through who? Jesus. Exactly what John tells us in John chapter 1. And then it says, he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his, God's nature. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. So as Peter was at the feet of Jesus, he was just not at the feet of some great prophet or some great messenger or some motivational speaker or some wonderful philosopher. Peter was at the feet of God. And we need to realize that very clearly. Because it is there at the feet of God, it is there at the feet of Jesus that you learn your purpose. And that's what I want you to see next is the purpose of God, the purpose of God. And to understand the purpose of God in our lives, we need to look at how Jesus defined his purpose for his life in coming into this world. And look what it says here. In, uh, if you back up to Luke chapter 4, verse 43, which is the last passage before we get to chapter 5, if you would back up there, you see this. Jesus says, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God because I was sent for what? This purpose. Jesus says, this is my purpose. My purpose is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And what is that good news? That you and I enter the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection. That's how we enter the kingdom of God. And so Jesus says, I have come to bring the good news of the kingdom. This is my purpose. And then when you look at the end of Jesus' life, as 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 he is facing the cross, Jesus says, as he prays to the Father, he says, I brought you glory by completing the work that you gave me to do, John 17, 4. So when you look at those two passages together, when, when you see our lives as a follower of Jesus... We share the same purpose. If you are a Christian, if you are a believer, your life has the same purpose as the life of Jesus. God wants you to bring Him glory in how you live your life, to bear His image, to be an image bearer, to reflect His glory. And God wants you to make a difference in the kingdom 
by sharing the good news of Christ through your life to build His kingdom. That's your purpose. To bring God glory and to build up His kingdom. That's why you're saved. That's why you're here. We are to bring God glory by doing the work that He has for us to do as we follow Christ. Now, look at this simple progression that we see in this story. It says, first you see Peter caught fish. Then you see that Jesus caught Peter. And then you see Peter caught men. Now, it's interesting to me that, that this is not the first encounter of Simon Peter with Jesus. The very first encounter that, that Peter had with Jesus was in John chapter 1, when his brother Andrew, who was a follower of John the Baptist, encountered Jesus, who John said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Andrew finds Peter and says, hey, Simon, guess what? We found the Messiah. And so when Jesus meets Peter for that first time, he looks into Peter and he speaks his purpose over Peter's life before they have any other interactions. He says, Peter, he says, Simon, you shall be called Peter, which means rock. Jesus was speaking his purpose into his life from that very first encounter. But this event in Luke chapter 5 was about a year later from John chapter 1. And, and so Peter had begun following Jesus. He began learning more about him. But he was more of a, a casual follower. He was more of a, a part-time commitment to Christ. Oh, he respected Jesus. He thought Jesus was a great messenger of God. And he wanted to know more. He wanted to learn more from Jesus. You, you look there in Luke chapter 4, and what you find is that Jesus is staying at Peter's home in Capernaum. And he even heals Peter's mother-in-law of the fever that she has. And Peter is watching all of these events, these miracles that Jesus is doing. And so he has welcomed Jesus into his life and into his home. But yet Jesus had so much more for his purpose for Simon, Peter. When Jesus tells Peter to let down the nets into the deep water, I just find that such an interesting dialogue there. So Jesus is teaching in Peter's boat, right? And then when he gets finished teaching, he says to Simon, he says, uh, I want you to go back out, let your nets down in the deep water. Now, now think about this for just a moment. They were washing their nets. They had done fished all night. They were exhausted. They were tired. And they had done pulled to the shore and they're off cleaning their nets and getting all that done and all that ready for the next night of fishing because that's when they fished was at night. That's when you had the best catch. And Jesus is asking him, you know those nets that you just cleaned, Peter? Go back out there and, and put them down in the deep water where professional fishermen would know there ain't much of a chance of even catching a minnow at that time of day. But what does Peter do? Peter says, Master, you know, we fished hard all night. We've caught nothing. That's Peter's way of saying, I'm the professional fisherman here. You know, you're a teacher and a carpenter. <laughs> but, Peter says, because you say so. I'll do it. When he uses that word master, that, that is actually a, a term that, that recognizes human authority over one's life. A human authority. Saying, hey, you know, you have an authority here. I, I respect you. I respect who you are. And I respect that, that you're a great teacher or, and you're a great authority. You're a man from God. And, and I'll do it because you say do it. But what happens after the miracle? He goes from, Master, I'll do what you say to, at the feet of Jesus, depart from me. I, I, I'm a sinful man, Lord. And what he is saying is, I realize I'm in the presence of God. I am having an encounter with God. And at that point, Jesus spoke God's purpose into Simon Peter's life. From now on, you will catch men. You will catch 
people. Peter's chosen call to be Jesus' closest disciple, to begin to become that rock what Jesus had spoken into his life, his purpose. And listen, as believers, as followers of Jesus, Jesus calls all of us to follow him full time. When you showed up at church today, Jesus doesn't expect you just to show up and be a part-time Christian. He wants you to show up and be fully committed. To be on board. To be sold out for Him. To be completely devoted to His purpose for your life. And no matter what our abilities are, our talents are, our resources are, no matter our vocation as believers, we all share the same purpose. How are we allowing God to work through our lives to catch people to build His kingdom and to bring Him glory. Not everyone. Peter was called for a special purpose. God was doing something very special. He was calling Peter to come on board as, as the full-time disciple to form the foundation of the church. And he was going to grow Peter into that position. It was a very special calling to full-time ministry. And many people today are called into full-time ministry, whether it's preaching or whether it's as missionaries or worship leaders, whatever that it might be. People are called into the vocation of ministry. However, every believer is called to the purpose of ministry and missions. Every believer. Every believer. Every believer. Every one of you who is a believer today, who is a Christian today, who says, I'm a follower of Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are called to ministry and missions. You are called to catch people. It's your purpose. Now, some people are doctors, and some people are lawyers, and some are nurses, and some are engineers, and some are teachers or coachers, coaches. <laughs> coaches. Some are construction workers, oil field people. Computer programmers, salesmen. The list goes on and on at, at what gifts, talents, occupations, vocations that you can have or that you have. But as a believer, that's not your purpose. Your purpose is to build the kingdom of God and glorify God. And so whatever you do and whatever your vocation is, God wants to work through your life for His purpose. As Jesus told the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and every believer has the Holy Spirit. You are empowered to use whatever gifts, talents, abilities, vocation that you work at. You are empowered through the Holy Spirit to be what? His witness. To be His witness. In your home, at work, in your community, at your school, wherever you are. That's your purpose. That is your purpose. And let's look at the last thing I want to talk to you about. And that's the challenge of obedience. The challenge of obedience. So, so where do you begin to discover the will of God in your life so that you can fulfill God's purpose through your life? Where do you begin? Where do you start? Now I'm talking about after you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, because that's the first place that we all start. You can't know God, love God, and live for God until you have received God's plan in your life through accepting Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. That's where God's purpose begins for you is your obedience to the gospel, trusting and obeying Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's the starting point. But how do you grow in to your purpose? And, and how do you become that person that God wants you to be? Well, in John chapter 6, the people ask Jesus, and I think we can be a lot like these folks. The people ask Jesus, what can we do to perform the works of God? What can we do to do what God wants us to do and to fulfill His will? And this is how Jesus responded. This is the work of God that you believe in the one that he has sent. 
John 6, 28 and 29. This is the work of God, that you believe in the one that he has sent. Jesus is saying to do the work of God in your life is about trusting and obeying Jesus in your life. Now, if you want to know, and I, I love this quote. We'll get to the quote in a minute. But if you'll look here at this encounter that takes place, and Peter and the others realize they're in the presence of God, and God has brought them to this point as, as they have followed him, then it says what? They left everything and followed him. They came to that point of total surrender saying, God, whatever you want us to do, that's what we're going to do. We're fully committed. We're totally on board. We left everything to follow you. Now, if you want to know God's will in your life, it begins with surrendering your whole life to Christ being willing to say, Lord, whatever you want for my life, that's what I want to do. I want to live out your purpose. And here's how that works. The way you discover God's will for the future is to do what you know to be God's will right now. The way you come to fulfill God's purpose for your life, to live out His will in the future is to do the next right thing, to do what you know God wants you to do right now, in this moment. And look at Simon Peter's life here. I think this is, this is so interesting. The first thing Jesus asks him, asks him to do is to use his boat for a floating pulpit. No problem. Sure, Lord, you can have my boat. Just push it on out, out to the shore a little bit from the shore, and you can teach in it all day if you want to, Lord. But then Jesus asks a little something more demanding. I want you to put the, those nets you just cleaned. I want you to take them back out and fish again. More time, more energy, more effort. But then three, the fully embracing God's purpose for his life as a full-time disciple. To leave everything to be in the ministry that Jesus was going to call him to be in. And here's what I, I don't want you to miss. It is the small steps of obedience that keep you in the will of God and allow God to work in you and through you to fulfill His purpose for you. Let me say that again. I think this is really important. It is the small steps of obedience that keep you in the will of God and allow God to work in you and through you to fulfill His purpose for you. It's the small steps of obedience. It is the little things you know that God wants you to do in your life. I would go out on a limb here, and I would say that every believer that's here today, you might say, hey, I don't know what God's will is for my life this year, next year, or whatever. But I bet you every believer here today could name me one thing you feel like God wants you to do. And maybe you've been struggling with that one thing. It might be as simple as talking to a neighbor. It might be as, as a little bit bigger as, as being involved with a mission trip or a mission project. Whatever that it might be, the things that God wants you to do right now, He just wants your trust and obedience to do them. That's the way He unfolds His plan and purpose for your life. You know, we can't say, you know, oh God, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read this passage, I'll give up everything, I'll do whatever you want me to do, Lord. And the Lord's like, well, I really wanted you to get up and go to church this, uh, this morning. I really wanted you to show up for Sunday school this morning. I really wanted you to speak to your co-worker about me. You see what I'm saying? 
the small steps of obedience bring us to a position of experiencing God personally in a way that brings about His change, His power into our lives that will fulfill our purpose. Now, I have a passage for that. If you'll look what Paul told the Philippian church, he says, So then, my dear friends, just as you have always what? Obey God in the small things of your life. Obey God in the little things of your life. Oh, I, I, I want to, I would love to get up, to be on my way to work, and to see that burning bush and to hear God speak into my life through that burning bush. And boy, Lord, if you would do something like that, I would leave everything and do whatever you wanted me to do. And the Lord says, well, I really wanted you to get up a little early and just spend time reading your Bible with me today. You could have started there. I might speak to you through the Bible. You see what I'm saying? As you have always obeyed, the small things are the important things. Yeah, Lord, you want my boat? Sure. Oh, okay, you want me to put out a little bit deeper into the water and, and, and go through all that time and energy again? Okay, Lord, I'll do it. Boom. Boom. There comes the experience of God. You see what I'm saying? He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, these people that were at the feet of Jesus, they were there humbly. They were there submissively. They were there dependently. They were there reverently. And then look what it says. For it is who? God who is working in you, enabling you both to will and to act for his what? For his good purpose. You see the connection? The challenge of obedience is always there. That's what God is asking you for. He, he wants you to take the small steps of obedience so that he can have this encounter with you personally that will renew your love for him, that will revive your desire to follow him, and that will empower your purpose for him as his witness, as his testimony. So let's close with this. As we experience Jesus, as we experience Jesus, we come to see who He really is as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Lord of all creation. But we also come to see ourselves for who we really are. Sinful, flawed, inadequate, insecure, in need, but guess what? Valuable and loved by God who has a purpose for our lives. This is the revelation that takes place at the feet of Jesus, where we come humbly, where we surrender to Him, where we are dependent upon Him, when we are reverent before Him. That's where we experience who He is. And His purpose is empowered in our lives. So let's close with this story. There was an old Mr. Jones, and he was somewhat of a fisherman. Now, old Mr. Jones, every time he would show up at the, the general store, boy, he just had ice chest full of fish. It's amazing. Well, the game warden got a little suspicious of Mr. Jones, now how he was catching all these fish all of the time. So he asked Mr. Jones about it, and Mr. Jones said, Well, Warden, why don't you just come on and go fishing with me tomorrow? So they showed up early in the morning, and they headed out in Mr. Jones' fishing boat. And he got them way over back there and almost nowhere on the back side of the lake. He didn't have a fishing rod. You know, all he had was a box and a couple big ice chests. And the game warden saying, how in the world are we going to catch fish? He doesn't even have a fishing rod. Well, he opens up that box and he pulls out a stick of dynamite. He lights that dynamite. He throws it over. Boom! Fish rise to the top. He takes his net, pulls them out, and dumps them in the box. Well, the game warden's eyes are this big. And he's like, boy, he starts reading the, the law. He starts telling, man, you're you going to be in serious trouble for this, man. He starts just really going and telling him all about what's fixing to happen because he's Breaking the law. And Mr. Jones just takes out that another stick of dynamite and lights it and he hands it to the game warden. 
Well, the game warden, he's just still, you know, you, you, know, you going, you know, we can't. And Mr. Jones just simply said, look, warden, are you going to talk or are you going to fish? <laughs> Boom. When we come to the scriptures, when we come to our need for revival, when we come to God's purpose for our lives, are we going to talk? Or are we going to fish? Are we going to come to God in repentance over the things that are in our lives that are keeping us from fulfilling our purpose? Are we going to open our hearts to receive what God wants to speak into our lives and what He wants to do in our lives? So that we can be revived by God? You see, God's Word is not just about talk. It's about a call. A call to obedience. To trust and to obey Jesus with your whole life. Lord, thank you for the time we have to look at your word today and, and this encounter that Peter and James and John and, and the other disciples had with you in this moment where they realized they were in the presence of God and that you had a greater purpose for their lives than, than just simply being fishermen. But you had the purpose of them being the fishers of men who would form the foundation of your church in this world. Lord, we share in that purpose. Lord, we share in your calling. And Lord, I pray that we would come before you with repentant hearts. Lord, seeking to receive from you, allowing you to speak into our lives about our purpose. Reviving our purpose for you as believers, to be your witnesses, to use our lives as a means of building your kingdom and bringing you glory. So God, as you speak today, may we respond in faith. May decisions be made here today, just as Peter made his decision when he said in your presence all that long time ago. And Lord, may we leave this place renewed in our love for you and revived in our desire to follow you and recommitted to our purpose for you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Would you stand?